Well, here we are, Monday, the 2 to 3 block. What an exciting show. This is a Hana Kako, um, and it is, it is a remarkable show in that we are covering the globe today. Um, we have Kali'i Akina, who's in Hong Kong right now. Um, Hello. I'm sorry? Aloha. Aloha. Aloha from Hong Kong. And um, we have uh, Malia Hill, and she's in Washington, D.C., and uh, we're all talking together around the world using Skype, which really is what, uh, you know, ThinkTech likes most to do. We like to bring people together. Hey, Hanukkah Co., right? <laughs> That's right, Jay. And, you know, I love the way you say it. It sounds like Hanukkah. <laughs> well, most things, if you're happy, you know, Hanukkah That's is right. always appropriate. And, and it's coming that, soon, too. <laughs> and we all know that a Hanukkah ko is like a pule kako, let's pray together. A Hanukkah ko is let's work together. And uh, you're all watching the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Yes, Jay, you are. Job. So we're going to call this show uh, Grassroot in China because, you know, there's, there's the director of Grassroot Institute Hawaii, and he's in China, and his policy manager, is that a fair statement of it, Malia? Policy person? Policy director? Okay. Director of policy? Yep, that's it. Okay, is in Washington, so you guys can compare notes. And the idea is to spread the wisdom, you know, from China to Washington and then back. Okay, let's start with what you've learned so far in your trip, this trip to China. Well, Jay, you know, I'm, I'm constantly learning. I want to be like you, a learner all the time. And <laughs> let's tell our folks a little bit about the uh, trip. Uh, for these three programs, this Monday and the next two Mondays, we are going to be communicating from China, from the east coast of the U.S., and Honolulu. And, you know, that's really kind of a, a metaphor of how the world it operates today, global. I get to spend three weeks in China doing a lot of neat things. One, um, I am an exchange faculty member of Peking University and the University of Hawaii. Uh, there's a great relationship between the two institutions, uh, so I do some research papers, some lectures, and so forth. And uh, in a week, I'll be going to the campus of Peking University. But in addition to that, as president of Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, uh, I get to connect with a lot of people who care about the economy and who care about government and who care about society. And you know, uh, in our world of Hawaii, we think our issues uh, loom large, and indeed they do. And when you get to China, they loom somewhat larger, and in many cases, they're the same issues. And I hope we get to talk a little bit about that. So, uh, Jay, with your counsel, we've called these three programs Grassroot in China. But may I say something uh, before handing this off, because I'd like the lady who is with us to introduce herself. Malia Blomhill is the brain behind a huge amount of writing, papers, blogs, newsletters, and anything else we do in print. She is our director of policy. And what exactly does that mean? Well, she basically coordinates the research that we do as a think tank, a research institute. Uh, not only does she research, she coordinates the work of scholars across the country and now across the world. And the product of that ends up on our website and in our papers and so forth. I actually, I actually think she knows a lot more than I do. Uh, I, I can tell you about policy. I can tell you what Socrates was thinking when he was sentenced to death in Athens. Uh, but Malia can tell you about Obamacare. So, <laughs> Malia, to you, say a few things, Malia. I wanted her to be here. Uh, number one, uh, because she's brilliant. Number two, because Jane would be left alone if the connection goes out between China and Hawaii. <laughs> if I wanted someone there to talk, talk fast, with you. <laughs> but thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, you know, I read Plato and I read Obamacare, and Plato is better. So. <laughs> That's a quotable quote for sure. <laughs> so I. <laughs> I kind of envy you there, but um, thank you. Thank you very much for, for that introduction. And yes, I've, I've been um, working with Grassroot for several years now, um, working with uh, our Jones Act policy and our uh, Native Hawaiian issues. And I'm really excited about all the new places we're going now, bringing in this sort of Asia Pacific economic connection. And, you know, Asia is so important to Hawaii's economy. And, you know, it's not something that we really talk about enough. So I'm really glad that we're, we're working in that direction because, you know, we know it in Hawaii, but we don't really act on it to the point to the extent that we really should be. So yeah. that's, a, that's a really interesting, interesting perspective. We get so isolated 
in Hawaii. And, and I'll be honest, in the mainland, I can tell you that's that's deserving. You know, in, in D.C., they forget about Hawaii all the time. So I don't not, I don't blame us for getting a little isolated, looking looking towards Asia instead of looking west sometimes. But I think it's really great, important work that we're doing, and I'm really glad to be a part of it. Well, Malia, that's you know, right. uh, Kali'i is about to uh, make a number of appearances in educational and other institutions in China, um, delivering a message, if you will. And I'm sure he has, you know, plans about what he's going to say. Maybe he'll share that with us. But I, I wonder, you know, uh, maybe you, maybe you folks have talked about this. But I wonder what your advice to him would be. What, what sort of issues should he be discussing, and what, what effect should he be seeking, in, you know, in, in rolling out the grassroots uh, platform or the American platform to the people he speaks to in China. Well, you know, it goes back, I guess, to the to the name of this program. It's about working together. You know, we can we can go on and on about the cultural differences, the divisions, the ways the ways that we're different. But you know, the whole point of this is finding those points of common ground, those points of common interest. And so, I think, you know, with Kali'i, I would say, you know, let's talk about let's talk about trade. Let's talk about economics. Let's talk about how our you know in the global economy we're tied together. Let's talk about the Jones Act. Please, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> how Hawaii needs to change, you know, how Hawaii needs exemptions and stuff that can help bring it into the global marketplace. So these are the kinds of things, these points of similarity I think we can find. Well, well, you know, have, uh, you, have you been uh, planning to make remarks along those lines? Uh, what, what, what will you be talking about? Well, you know, what's interesting, what's interesting, Jay, is as I've gotten ready for this trip, which is probably my fifth or sixth trip to China, uh, I have not been told by dear friends and colleagues and advisors what to say. More often than not, I'm told what not to say. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother told me, don't get, don't get uh, arrested for anything I say. <laughs> we'll come and, and get you out, Kali. <laughs> that's right. She's a picture of China that goes back many years, in, in which it was, really wasn't safe to say a lot of things that people are saying. But along the lines of what Malia was just uh, remarking on, there's a certain set of core issues that are common to people who love liberty across the world. And I think that's the natural human condition, to want to be free, to want to be empowered, to want to be self-governing. And uh, whether we're in uh, the post-Soviet Union, or whether we are in Asia, whether we're in China or in the United States, there's something about the fact that human beings value themselves and value their future and want to determine them. And so. Uh, especially for those uh, viewers who may be new to our program and don't know a lot about Grassroots Institute, let me say a, a few things because they dovetail with why we're in China. At the Grassroots Institute, we, we believe in three values. Uh, they're very important values. Individual liberty, free markets, and limited accountable government. But it's not just we in America who value these things. Uh, people across the world do. And in China, I would say the majority of people here care about individual liberty. They have learned to express it, to exploit it, if you will, to develop it, to grasp it in different ways. They have different challenges. But you talk to the average person here, whether they're an academic or whether they are a shopkeeper, a taxi driver, or someone in government, they care about their own autonomy, their own freedom. So individual liberty is a concern here. Uh, free markets. I don't think there are is uh, another group of people as entrepreneurial as the Chinese. So the idea of being able to trade without people interfering uh, with that, without government interfering, is, is a very great value here. And in an emerging uh, entrepreneurial market, a lot of people are concerned about how safe it is to, to do it and build business uh, and do the conditions exist. We're in Hong Kong, and we'll talk a bit about why Hong Kong is important to China. And the third area that's important to grassroots, in addition to individual liberty and free markets, is limited accountable government. And, and you know, that may seem strange to us in, in the United States. Well, I'm sure it's stranger still in China. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, well, it may seem strange to us to conceive that people talk about that in China, that we have come several decades away from the Cultural Revolution, that there has been an evolution, if you would, in the way government is done. Uh, of course, the, the ruling party is the Communist Chinese Party, but becoming so big means it has gained a great deal of diversity. I think we're seeing something like that in Hawaii, too. There is a governing party in the state of Hawaii, 
and it is so dominant that uh, it, it expresses a great deal of diversity within it. So those are three values that um, I'm able to carry out d dialogue on with a lot of people in China. But let me, let me just let uh, Malia interject, or you, Jay, because I've been talking a little bit long here. Uh, my main point was simply this. The things about which we care in the United States are things that people in China care about. Well, I, I, will, I will interject to say this is about the time we should take our first break. Um, this is Think Tech. Uh, we're doing a Hanukkah, which normally broadcasts right here from Honolulu. But today we have an international global hookup, if you will, uh, with Kali Akina in Hong Kong and uh, Malia Blum Hall, Blum Hill uh, in Washington. She's the policy director for uh, uh, Grassroot Institute, and Kali is the director. And we're talking about his trip. We're talking about what um, a grassroot and, and Hawaii can give the, to China and vice versa. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back after this break. We want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle and Cook Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashen. See you next time. Okay, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech. Think Tech on a Hanukkah Co. Our Monday program, except it is emanating from uh, Hong Kong. Uh, on the one, on the one hand, Kali Yakin is there now, um, en route to um, China uh, to do uh, to a, a variety of appearances, and uh, his policy director for Grassroot Institute is Malia Blumhill, and she's in Washington, D.C. And we're back now. And uh, you know, during the break, we talked about what to cover next, and I think it was mutually agreed, was it not, that we would talk about economics, uh, since Hong Kong is, the, you know, the very epicenter of global economics these days. Um, so how does that fit? Um, you know, what, what would you say to them? What would, they, what would they say to you that you'd like to bring back? And what do you recommend, Malia? What should he talk about in Hong Kong? Well, far be it from me to dictate what he should talk about, but I know what I want to know about, which is... Um, you know, P.J. O'Rourke wrote about visiting Hong Kong right on the eve of the handover from Britain to uh, China and about how Hong Kong had basically made its success based on really the principles we espouse, which is all about, you know, probably the most, one of the most free systems in the world in terms of government involvement in business. And that was the key to Hong Kong's success. So everyone, you know, afterwards is waiting to see, well, how will this thrive? Will it continue to thrive and survive? How will people react? you know, afterwards. And now, I guess that's kind of what I want to know. What is the, what is the environment like? How has it changed? How, you know, how does the Hong Kong miracle, so to speak, continue? Is it, you know, is it something that, what can we take away from it, essentially? Well, Kali, you just got off the plane. You took the taxi cab to your hotel. You unpacked your computer and called us. And so you must know a lot more now than you did half an hour ago, eh? <laughs> Well, you know, Hong Kong is such a bustling, wonderful place. Uh, there is business everywhere. I came in at about 2 a.m. to my hotel, and I saw a lot of business in the streets. <laughs> it, 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 stores and clothes. And, uh, you know, there is the entrepreneurial spirit. But, but seriously, we have a lot to learn from Hong Kong. Hong Kong as, is part of China, and Hong Kong is valued by China. Uh, Hong Kong is one of the world's major economic engines. Uh, as you know, Grassroot Institute is part of a nationwide network of think tanks. And uh, one of the groups we're affiliated is, with is the Heritage Foundation. They publish an annual report, which is the economic 
index freedom, the freedom of the index of economic freedom. And in that report, there are three cities that, or three regions that are listed as the most free economic regions in the world. And what that means is these are the regions in which the free market exists at the highest levels. Number one is Hong Kong, number two is Singapore, and number three is New Zealand by one report and Australia by another report. But the key thing is that Hong Kong and Singapore are always li listed at the top. And, and this is something that uh, the Chinese government has not failed to notice. The Chinese government looks to Hong Kong as a model for what it wants to do with its larger cities, as well as some of, the, some of its new economic zones in southeast China. Uh, in particular, Hong Kong is one of two special administrative regions, the other being Macau, uh, and increasingly there are other uh, economic re regions that are set aside in which the government tells the rest of China, don't tamper with this. What's going on is good. We like it. We, we want to export that. What do they want? They want to have an economy that is robust. They want to have an economy that is producing uh, a standard of living for people that, that grows the middle class as well as makes the country wealthy. And basically, that's how they view Hong Kong. So it's an interesting thing. Uh, China, since the heavy-handed rule under Mao Zedong, has gone through different uh, phases of development. And uh, I, I'm not, I have to confess that not all academics or scholars see it the way I do, but I tend to think that there is a philosophy of pragmatism for the most part. That China, for the most part, is committed to doing that which works. And, and that, more than anything, has led them to have a hands-off policy with regard to Hong Kong. It, it, and they have had that, for the most part. And, and they're trying to reproduce what it is. The, the issue that gives room to groups like Grassroot Institute and numerous think tank it, policy institutes throughout China, and I'll be visiting them, we'll talk a little bit about them, the issue that, that gives us room is the fact that the Chinese government is very interested in knowing what it is that makes these regions work. Let me go back to Malia. Malia, you, you quoted P.J. O'Rourke. And what did you notice in, in his analysis uh, about why it is that Hong Kong works or places, places like Hong Kong? Well, okay, I'm going to be giving away how much of my political philosophy comes from P.G. O'Rourke now, but it's really part of a greater look. It was part of, a, I believe, a book of his that was a bigger look at, you know, what is the secret? What is the secret to wealth? What is the secret to success as a country? And it pretty much always came down to um, how much people could, you know, how much the rule of law existed in a country and how much the government basically kept you from doing what you wanted economically. So it, it really came down to um, the red tape, the, the that economic freedom index that you, you talked about. And, you know, he spends, you know, he spends time in Sweden and he spends time in obviously the U.S. and he spends time on Wall Street and he spends time in places like Albania. Hong Kong stands out specifically because he observes that, you know, the red tape in Hong Kong, at least at the time, you know, was pretty much non-existent. So that entrepreneurial spirit you talk about basically had complete room to thrive. And the response is a wealthy, bustling, busy, business-oriented area. And, you know, to an extent that even the United States could envy. And that's one of those, um, one of those lessons that you think, you know, how, how can we take this lesson and bring it back to Hawaii, for example, with its multitude of red tape? <laughs> Well, I'm glad you mentioned Hawaii, because we can learn a lesson from the reason that Hong Kong is successful. Um, I, I love talking about Hong Kong and Singapore when I'm in Beijing or in Shanghai and other parts of China, because it gets the attention of the audience. It gets the attention of the business people. It uh, gets the attention of the uh, government people. And uh, one of the, the questions that I like to raise is why, if you want to be like Hong Kong, if you want uh, your cities to become like Hong Kong, what is it that Hong Kong has that has made it the way it is? Well, number one, at the top, you've got free markets. In other words, you have the uh, uh, businesses have the ability to do business without a significant amount of government interference. That's very important. You have the, the market operating in realistic ways in terms of supply and demand. So in order to have free markets, I ask them, what do you need? You need to have the rule of law. That's absolutely essential. That's what Hong Kong owes to its British heritage. 
Jay, you're an attorney, and you know how how legalistic, in, if you would, the British Empire was. But it established a framework, a structure whereby contracts would be honored, whereby uh, there was a, an appropriate amount of regulation by government, where, whereby crimes were were deterred and so forth. So for the most part, you've got the rule of law. And then the third item, the first being the free market, the second being the rule of law, the third item is you've got individual autonomy. Individuals can act in their own uh, best self-interest. Individuals are free to do that. Uh, it may get clouded if we talk about words like liberty or human rights and so forth. But the bottom line is that Hong Kong has had good doses of these three things, free markets, the rule of law, and individual liberty. And so this framework becomes something by which we can examine other cities in China. And Malia, as you alluded to it, it's what we do in Hawaii when we take a look at the government and business in Hawaii. To what extent do we have free markets? To what extent do we have the rule of law? To what extent do we have individual liberty? And, and take one area, for example, um, Hong Kong and Singapore uh, benefit greatly from an open policy in terms of shipping. Uh, we have an issue that you love greatly, uh, Malia, and that is the 1920 Maritime Act known as the Jones Act. Uh, for, it's no accident that today, there, this week, there are 81 ships in port in Hong Kong, and in Hawaii, there could be three, two of them Matson and one of them Horizon, uh, because of what has happened to, happened to our shipping industry through a protectionist practice. A free market says, let's lift the protectionism. You know, let, let's not protect Detroit from Toyotas and, and uh, Hondas as we did for many years. Let, let's promote robust competitive economics. And, and that's really the spirit you have here in Hong Kong and in places like Singapore, the free market. So those are the three elements that I think become a good criterion by which you can judge any society. Free markets, the rule of law, and the individual liberty. How does that sound to, to you, Jay? Well, uh, you know, the Chinese have, have retained Hong Kong. They, they could have, they could have um, you know, changed the economy of Hong Kong when they, when they took it back. Uh, they could have made profound changes that would deprive Hong Kong of, of the, with the British uh, legacy, but they didn't do that. And I think one of the big reasons, big reason, is that Hong Kong is a port for investment. Money comes like ships from all over the world into Hong Kong, and Hong Kong businessmen do business all over China investing that money. And so a good bit of the, the foreign investment that comes into China has customarily come through Hong Kong. Uh, through the investment firms there. And you can talk to anybody doing business in Hong Kong and they will tell you how much money goes that way. But I think things are changing though. And that, you know, when you make your trip to mainland China, you ought to, you ought to watch for the change, the sea changes. Because I think some of the investment now is coming direct. Uh, it's coming through these young lawyers, such as the lawyers in our exchange program who just appeared on our show just a few minutes ago, uh, you know, who are reaching out to all parts of the world and achieving uh, investment connections directly that way. The other thing I want to mention, uh, and I really like your reaction on it, either now or when you had a chance to look at it, is the free trade zone uh, that, the, uh, that Beijing has just set up in Shanghai. They want to make Shanghai more like Hong Kong. They want to learn from them, you know, they want to take the lessons of the free market in, in Hong Kong and build them into uh, the mainland China system, whatever that may be. And uh, it's an experiment, I think, but they took a, an area in Shanghai and gave it uh, free trade. There's all kinds of uh, exceptions from the ordinary regulation uh, in the hopes that it would grow in the same way that Hong Kong has grown. The jury is out on that. There's a certain amount of skepticism as to whether it will work, a certain amount of uh, discussion about how when they created this, they just started building regulations to take it back to square one anyway. Um, but the idea is, uh, they think that Hong Kong can be duplicated in China. Maybe we should have the idea that Hong Kong can be duplicated in Honolulu. <laughs> well, you know, uh, there is some value in, in this from a visionary point of view. Uh, when you go to, to Singapore, when you go to Hong Kong, and you see the level of commerce, uh, and you realize how, how much wealth is generated by that, it's natural for the Chinese Communist government to say, we want our other cities to be like this. The important thing, however, is to use this as an opportunity to stress that a free market is not just 
here's a place where there are no rules. <laughs> that's, a, that's a misnomer. Um, a free market can only exist when you do have the rule of law. And, and this is the real challenge for China, uh, because there are business people, uh, nationals, who, as well as uh, uh, expatriates from the U.S. and uh, Europe and elsewhere, who are fleeing China at the same time that China is trying to develop a free market. And the story that we hear over and over again is because of, a, of government expropriation of their property or of the failure of patent laws to protect their, their work uh, and so forth. So what's happening is uh, the advances that a quote-unquote free market make can't stand on their own. They're going to need a legal structure to, to support that. And uh, I, Jay, don't get your hopes up. I'm not saying they need more lawyers. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I think we need to take a short break, Lee, but when we come back, I'd sure like to hear uh, Malia's thoughts about exactly how much law do we need. Um, you know, some, some say that in Honolulu and Hawaii we've got too much law and regulation and process. Uh, and in mainland China, maybe sometimes uh, it's unpredictable. And I agree with you absolutely that you need, you need to have the rule of law but you also have to have predictability and you have that process that actually gets you there within a reasonable period of time, uh, you know, given the 21st century. Anyway, let's take a short break. This is uh, Think Tech Hawaii. We're doing a Hanukkah ko, uh, straddled around the world uh, between Kali'i uh, Akina, our host in Hong Kong, and uh, Malia Blumhill, uh, his policy director in Washington, D.C. We'll be right back after this short break. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaiian Foreign Trade Zone, number nine, has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBED, the Hawaii Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program. It does so to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Mahalo. Hi, welcome back to ThinkTech, a Hanukkah Co., our Monday 2 to 3 show uh, featuring host Kali'i Akina of Grassroot Institute. He happens to be in Hong, Hong Kong at the moment, and we have on the line another uh, Skype hookup with Malia Blum Hall, who is in Washington. I love these global straddle shows. So uh, as we left it, Malia, you know, and I hope uh, Kali'i will go along with my question. Um, so what is the level of precedent, you know, of, um, uh, what do you call it, of, of, of laws, of stare decisis, of, you know, predictability, the rule of law uh, that you would like to see in the U.S. based on the experience in China? You know, it's interesting. Uh, Kili, you talked about, you know, in order to have a successful free market, you need to have, you know, some sort of trust that the government isn't putting its thumb on its on the scale, so to speak, that contracts can be upheld and such. I remember, um, I love the British show Top Gear. It's uh, Cars. Cars are awesome. And <laughs> they did a show about, um, you know, we all know about purses and, um, you know, the, the, the mock purses and such, the rip-off purses you can get from China and so on and so forth. But they did one about cars, about how you could get basically a fake BMW mm -hmm. in China. And it looked exactly like, it physically looks exactly like a real BMW missing maybe the, the logo. And then they drive them and it's not even close. But, you know, some of the questions, no, horrible, it's very funny. But <laughs> the question was really about, you know, in a broader sense, this is the problem that companies face. You know, that whole, you have to be able to trust, you have to be able to trust in copyright, you have to be able to trust in patent, because otherwise, you know, there's no, you know, the, the government it refuses to crack down on the, on the fake car uh, industry they it's good for them so they just let it go but that drives out investment and this is the kind of balance we're looking for because i would say on the other hand hawaii well we have a lot of safeguards 
maybe too many, too many safeguards. And that's the balance that we try to find. And, you know, I, of course, believe that, you know, at the point at which you have too much red tape, too many hoops for bureaucrats to jump through, I mean, too many hoops for companies to jump through, too many taxes, too many regulations, then, you know, that's the government putting too many safeguards in place, really throttling that entrepreneurial spirit. On the other hand, the point at which, you know, as Kaliti said, a completely totally free market is not a free market because then companies can't trust that their ideas are safe. You know, they can't trust that, you know, they can take a product to market and benefit from their own time spent in research and production and development. So there is a balance to be found here. You know, it's not a Wild West thing that we advocate. It's a, a, a finely tuned sort of balance between you know, upholding contracts, upholding, you know, the idea that the, the principle that an idea is worth something and that an individual idea, you know, I, I'm a copyright is, a, is a one of those examples where there's a balance, where balance needs to be sought. And I'm a big fan. I, I believe in copyright laws. I believe that, you know, protecting ideas is something, but I also will agree with the libertarian principle that there are limits, that it's silly that people can't sing happy birthday. Uh, because because of copyright law. Um, <laughs> I'm going to sing it anyway. <laughs> but you know, what, what, what is the level? What, what would you can you define where it should be? Um, you know, sometimes it's too much. Sometimes it's too little. Uh, where what's the how do you how do you know what how do you know when it's right? Let me let me interject something while Malia thinks through her brilliant response to <laughs> the question of the ages. That's a question for Solomon uh, to answer. But uh, the rule of law, uh, let me clarify, does not mean more law. That's very important to understand. And in most uh, developed societies, we have pretty much all the laws we need, and if we could get rid of a lot more, that's important. Hong Kong, quite interestingly, uh, has a frame of reference that protects commerce but uh, as social welfare and the desire to provide the needs of the many rises, uh, new laws are emerging. For example, as of 2010, they now have a minimum wage law. Now, that's quite interesting because Hong Kong has been held up as a free market, and free market advocates uh, generally are not big fans of minimum wage uh, because basically you're telling a store owner, you're telling a retailer, you're telling somebody who's trying to, to make a living um, you know, by uh, by running a little shop, that they cannot hire a certain, uh, they cannot hire people at a certain rate. They're going to have to to pay something, and so so it hurts the productivity of that store for the most part, and very often it, it doesn't really result in ensuring a certain level income level for everybody. What ensures a, a growing income level is a robust economy free from rules like the minimum wage. And we've got a great article on that by uh, economist Ken Skoland, right, uh, Malia, on our website? Ken Skoland is one of our affiliated economists. So here's the problem. Even great economies like Hong Kong have the problem of encroaching growth of law. So the rule of law doesn't mean more laws, and it also must mean that government also abides by the law. We understand at, at Grassroot Institute the value of limited, accountable government. And so going back to your question originally about China, can China turn Shanghai, Beijing, other cities into a Hong Kong? The issue is not economy. The issue is not infusing those cities with huge amounts of money for investments. There has to be the infrastructure of law that holds government accountable because you you cannot have government tampering uh, with the, the rights of businesses and individuals if you're going to have a robust free market in which people are going to take risk. Risk is a very important factor in the free market. If, if there were no basis in, on which um, risk could be taken with some measure of assurance that that, that the government is not going to hold all the cards and, and do you in. Uh, businesses won't take risks. Um, I, in Hawaii, for example, do you think we're going to get 10 businessmen from New York to invest uh, several million dollars in another super ferry? <laughs> then there's a question as to whether or not we have the kind of proper order in order to, to execute. So the money's there. The money is there. But the trust is not there. Yeah. Well, you know, one, one thing that concerns me 
is that you have a, essentially a civil law system in, in China. You don't have uh, stare decisis, you don't have precedent so much. Um, and, but they are studying the law in the U.S., which is the other system, the British system, the precedent system. Uh, in fact, uh, two weeks ago, there were two lawyers uh, from uh, two, two different places in China who were here for one specific purpose, and that was to watch a jury trial. They wanted to see an American jury trial, and they made the trip here uh, for that purpose, uh, just to see that. And, you know, you think, well, they're, they're going to learn how we do it. But maybe some of the lessons they learn will get them into the same problems that we have. So, you know, how, how do we guide them? What do we say to them uh, to, you know, explain the right balance? I'll take a quick stab and then hand off to Malia or, or back to you, Jay. I, I think that we must understand the difference between technical proficiency in the law and the values on which the law rests. And, and this is very important. China uh, is producing lawyers like crazy, and you you, you could go to a three-year postgraduate program for law. But also, but I think I think most lawyers. I could be wrong on this. Most lawyers in China are the product of, of college, so so they come out of a, a rather technical background without a strong values and humanities base, and and so they they become proficient. At, at, the, at the practice of the technicality, but when it comes to issues such as ethics, ethics is no longer the application of value. Ethics, whether it's in business or in, in any other endeavor, becomes avoiding breaking laws or getting away with what you can get away with. It becomes compliance. And so the comment that I want to make before handing off is simply this. Law is not about better lawyers or better administration of laws. We have to get back to the place where we understand the values that underlie law. The values such as ensuring individual autonomy, values such as keeping the federal government from encroaching upon the rights that are delegated, that are left to the states. These kinds of values uh, are, by the way, values that research institutes throughout China are starting to study. and that's. Uh, what my trip is all about. I'm going to several of them here in Hong Kong and in Beijing, uh, where the values basis for law and economy is being researched, being talked about a lot. Malia, did you have some thoughts? Actually, I did. You know, you mentioned earlier you're talking about uh, contracts and minimum wage, and I thought that was kind of an interesting example because, you know, I will be the first to admit that our common law system does have its faults, but I don't know that they would necessarily point to them as the source of the problems that we're looking at. In fact, in a way, I almost feel like they bear more in common with the civil law system. Well, let's just take the minimum wage example you gave. You know, previously you would say that that would be a matter of contract between the employee and the employer, what the wage is going to be. Minimum wage law comes in as an act of legislature to say, well, we think that this should be it. We're not going to abide by your contract. Now, you know, in a common law system, ideally, that's down to contract law. Contract law is not, um, ex you know, doesn't have a lot of retribution in it. If someone breaks the contract, there's an easy way to figure out what the value of the contract is. It doesn't make a grand rule for everyone. You know, we have an unfortunate tendency. I don't know, like lawmakers in a vacuum just feel the need to act. We have an unfortunate tendency in the U.S. to say, you know what, I see a problem there. We're not going to leave it to contract. We're going to enact a law that will apply across the board to everyone. We will take that out of the realm of contract and bring it to the realm of civil law. That's almost the opposite of the problem, you know, of a system, of what was the ideal would be, I suppose, under, under a common law system. So if we, you know, far be it from China to take that from us, we need to take that from us. <laughs> <laughs> this tendency to take things out of the ability, out of that common law system, and, and bring it to the level of civil, of, of legislation, so to speak. Well, what you happen to be going at exactly the right time? Because I, mean, I believe the Chinese, especially the Chinese lawyers and the judicial system, are thinking about these very issues, about remaking their system so it, it comports on a global basis, so it can deal more easily with uh, you know, contracts with and in the U.S. and probably uh, in Europe in the same way. 
and they're, I think they're trying to globalize their system as well as make it work better for the economy within the country. And so when you go and you talk to them, they're going to be very interested in hearing what you have to say about how they shape it going forward. Well, you know, one of the things that I find there's growing interest in in China is an authentically Chinese approach to understanding culture and law. Uh, for many years, Chinese were, were technicians, very much pragmatic. And uh, when they would find areas of law that needed to be addressed, oftentimes they would take American law or British law and dump it into their into their legal system out of context sometimes, but just at least the establishment of code was there. And um, this is a very good time to be talking with thinkers at all levels, whether they're educators or in government or in business, about what it means to be authentically Chinese. And, and there is a resource that is in increasingly becoming safe to the Chinese, and that's the classical Confucian teaching. The classical Confucian teaching, which goes back to Confucius about six centuries BC, is really the foundation for the way Asia from China up through Japan thinks about justice, about freedom, about the individual, about society, about roles, about relationships, about what makes a good society. and. Um, the truth is that the outcomes of such a vision line up very, very nicely with what those in the West consider human rights. But the nice thing for Chinese is it's not a lesson being taken from the West. It's ancient, it's authentically Chinese, and it also gives them something to take to the table. And uh, this goes back to my earlier comment. Uh, the practice of law needs to be based upon the understanding of the values of the law. And, and when those come together, and I think this is a good time to be advocating for that in universities and in um, institutes that reach out to government, uh, then we have hope for a better society. Oh, ho. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I mean, I think I think you are on the right track to uh, talk with them, both in Hong Kong and on the mainland. Um, I, I just uh, wonder uh, how they will react to problems that are uniquely American. I mean, for example, you can use the, the uh, Hong Kong and uh, Singapore experience on the Jones Act. I mean, not having a Jones Act, that's a great lesson for the U.S., but what is a lesson in the U.S. that you could give them? Uh, you know, I think it becomes more difficult uh, to give them lessons in American law these days as they learn more about what we have and don't have. Um, but, but let me... Uh, let me, let me take the, the next two or three minutes, though, to talk about what you're going to do from this point forward uh, and, and Malia's advice in that regard. I mean, we, we do count on her for the advice. <laughs> What's this a question, Malia? You know, let me pop in because I actually have a quick question based on, on what you said, and maybe this ties in, which is, um, you know, Victor Davis Hanson, uh, the historian, talks a lot about uh, different cultural values that really define how we move forward. And he talks a lot about Western individualism, defining both, you know, our culture, the way that we approach political problems, the way that we approach economy, even the way that we approach war, and how it tends to contrast rather dramatically with uh, values in Asia and the East, and specifically, and does and I think someone would ask, you know, does that create a conflict in the message that you're taking with you? Is there a basic cultural divide there? That's a great question, and, and you've mentioned two polarities. On one hand, rugged individualism in the West, which we have fought for, and we kind of think of our founding fathers in, in the, and the Declaration of Independence as as expressing that don't tread on me kind of attitude. On the other hand, the other polarity is being part of a culture. In fact, most, most of us think of Japan in, in, in this way, that, that one, one fits into one's family, one fits into one's, one's corporation. And so roles are more important at that level, whereas in the West, rights are more important. So you have the classical conflict between rights and roles. I think that a, a, a deeper reflection shows that these are not so far apart from each other in Chinese thought, nor are they far apart from, from each other in Western philosophical thought. Uh, they, they do get polarized by institutions, obviously, over time. But if you go back to the core thinking, 
to the actual documents that define what Western philosophy is about and what Chinese philosophy and Asian philosophy are about, you'll find that, that these concepts of rights and roles interact. And in some ways, they're mirror reflections of, of each other. Uh, that the, the role one plays in one's family also generates a right because you have somebody who has the right to expect you to play that role. And so they're not completely far apart from each other. Um, I, I like to think of uh, Confucius. So I want to give, give you, before your break, Jay, do you have time for me to give a quote from Confucius before the break? I uh, always have time for a quote from Confucius. <laughs> <laughs> and I recommend the same view to everyone. <laughs> you know, a lot of times people think of Confucius through cultural lenses, that Confucius they, they believe Confucius taught you should stay in your role. You should not leave your role. If you were born the daughter of a father the, and become the wife of a husband and then be, you get taken care of as the mother of your oldest son, you have a role you play all your life, but you don't have an identity. Well, this is the furthest thing from the truth in Confucius. Back in the days of Confucius, people thought fate ruled everything. They thought that the Tao ruled everything, that the stars ruled everything. And so I'll close with this quote that he gives because it expresses real human autonomy. He says, it is not the Tao which makes the person, it is the person who makes the Tao. Ah, I've heard you say that before. That's wonderful. <laughs> well, it's great to talk to you guys at opposite ends. We're about out of time. Uh, this is Think Tech uh, doing, uh, well, I guess it's doing Asia in Review, but it's a Hanukkah Ko uh, with uh, Kali Akina in Hong Kong and uh, Malia Blum Hill in Washington, D.C. We're going to do another show like this next week and I guess the week after in the same way. So we're looking forward to more based on more of your travels and thoughts while you're, while you're in China, Kali. Well, great. Uh, um, while in Hong Kong here, tomorrow I'm addressing the American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, because they're very interested in building with us at Grassroot Institute the Hawaii China Bridge. And then I'm going to be speaking with the leaders of Hong Kong's leading free market think tank, the Lion Rock Institute. Uh, they are to Hong Kong what Grassroot Institute is to Hawaii, a critical voice promoting individual liberty, free market, and liber limited accountable government. And I want to say thank you to our policy director. We're not a national organization. We are a Hawaii organization. But we have people all over the country because uh, Hawaii has a brain drain. When our economy, when we fix the economy and get and modify the Jones Act, Malia, you can move back and raise your family here. Huh? <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Malia. Uh, thank you, Klee. Uh, aloha, uh, Sai Jin, Che Che. We'll talk to you next week. Sai <laughs> Jin. Bye. Bye.